Stephen, it's a paradox. And the paradox is this, is that when we lower testosterone, the PSA levels will go down. But yet when we give testosterone to men with normal levels of testosterone, even in super physiologic doses, it has no effect on PSA. Welcome back to the TRT and Hormone Optimization YouTube channel. And as a guest in high demand, back with us is Dr. Keith Nichols. Welcome back, Keith. Hey, great to see you again, Stephen. Been a lot of fun. Hi, man. Welcome back. And um, today, let's talk about maybe one of the biggest myths concerning TRT, and that's the one about prostate cancer. So let's talk about that today. I'm sure you get a lot of questions regarding prostate cancer in your Facebook group and, and you know, in other places. There's not a, a week that goes by that I don't see a new patient that was told by their family doctor or their internist or the endocrinologist that testosterone was going to either cause prostate cancer or, or increase their risk of getting it or make it worse if they had it. And it's interesting to find out where these beliefs come from. So I think it's important that everybody understand testosterone and prostate cancer, more specifically, the history of Dr. Huggins, Dr. Morgenthaler, and the saturation model. Now, Stephen, this is probably one of my favorite slides when it comes to testosterone therapy or even hormone replacement therapy. And that is, the problem is not that people are uneducated. The problem is that they are educated just enough to believe what they've been taught and not educated enough to question what they have been taught. Yeah. As you and I both know, there's a lot of misinformation that goes on into the testosterone replacement therapy field. There are plenty of myths out there that we're going to discuss. The first being testosterone and prostate cancer. And as you know, there are other myths that we're going to discuss in the upcoming weeks, which include the need for estradiol management in testosterone therapy, as well as the harm from the secondary erythrocytosis when one takes testosterone, which is the increase in hemoglobin and hematocrit that occurs. It's in fact the most common side effect. So, so much, much information, misinformation out there on those three topics, prostate cancer, estradiol management, and then the secondary erythrocytosis. Yeah. All right. Well, Stephen, the belief for over seven decades now has been that high testosterone causes prostate cancer or increases a man's risk of developing prostate cancer and that low testosterone is protective against prostate cancer. Yeah. It was also thought that if you raise testosterone levels, you would cause an existing prostate cancer to grow rapidly, the equivalent of pouring gasoline on a fire. We've all heard that. Now, where did this so-called androgen hypothesis originate? Well, it originated in 1941. There was a paper written that year by two urologists, Drs. Huggins and Dr. Hodges. Now, Dr. Huggins, was a very well-known urologist. In fact, he went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize in 1966 for his work with hormones and cancers. And even to this day, he's considered one of the patron saints of, of, of urology. So in 1941, this is their study, studies on prostate cancer, the effect of castration, of estrogen and of androgen injection on serum phosphatases in metastatic carcinoma of the prostate. Now, in this paper, they looked at men with metastatic prostate cancer. Now, back then, they didn't have a PSA test like we do now. So they looked at something kind of similar, which was called prostate acid phosphatase. And they used this as a serum marker for metastatic prostate cancer. Now, in this study, Dr. Huggins reported that when men were castrated, either surgically or chemically, that these acid phosphatase levels would go down. He also gave men testosterone injections. And he reported that in every man that he got testosterone, gave testosterone injections to, that this acid phosphatase level would go up. So in other words, if they gave him testosterone, this marker for prostate cancer would rise. But when he castrated them, brought their testosterone levels down, that serum acid phosphatase would go down. Now, this was an important paper at the time because this was actually the first paper that identified a cancer to be hormonally sensitive. And it did establish three things at the time that prostate acid phosphatase could be used as a serum marker for metastatic prostate cancer, that castration was effective for metastatic prostate cancer, and that testosterone injections given to men with metastatic prostate cancer was dangerous. Now, when we take a closer look at this paper, you'll see that testosterone injections were only given to three men. Results were only given for two of those men. 
And one of those men had been surgically castrated, so he was no longer hormonally intact and what one would call hormonally or androgen deprived. And these are the, this is the report of the two men that he did give the results from, and they gave he gave them by the, uh, their abbreviations of their names, CB and OA. CB had already been surgically castrated, so he was no longer hormonally intact. But OA was hormonally intact, and he was given testosterone propionate injections, 25 milligrams for 18 days. And these are his serum acid phosphatase levels that were measured, represented by the solid line here. As you can see, very erratic. So the general conclusion that cancer of the prostate is activated by androgen injections was based on one hormonally intact patient who received testosterone injections, as I said, for 18 days, whose acid phosphatase levels went up and down and were essentially uninterpretable. So literally decades of depriving men of testosterone was based on the overinterpretation of the results of one single man in one study that you just saw. So most people will ask, well, well, how can that occur? That, that really doesn't make sense. Well, it's easily explained in the fact, by the fact that in the 1940s and 1950s, there were not many physicians that had experience utilizing testosterone and no one had any adequate knowledge to really question the results. So this paper became dogma that testosterone was dangerous for the prostate and caused prostate cancer. Now, it wasn't until the 1990s that a Harvard urologist by the name of Abraham Morgenthaler began to question the validity of this androgen hypothesis. So in 1988, he began treating men with sexual dysfunction who had low testosterone with testosterone. Now, treatment options were limited for these men at that time because there wasn't any Cialis or Viagra, so he was going to utilize testosterone to try to improve their sexual function. But what he noticed is not only did they improve sexually, but they improved both physically and mentally. Now, you've got to understand how brave this man was because his treatment at that time defied standard medical care. Because in the 1980s, testosterone therapy was really limited to three groups of men. Men who had congenital or con genetic disorders like Klinefelter's, uh, pituitary disorders, or those that had absent testes from injury or illness. But nonetheless, he did become concerned because his colleagues were warning him that he could potentially be causing harm to these people based on the work of Dr. Huggins. So in 1992, he began performing biopsies prior to giving men testosterone in men that were symptomatic due to testosterone deficiency, but who had normal PSAs and normal digital rectal exams. Now, what he was trying to do is rule out an existing prostate cancer so it wouldn't be like pouring gasoline on a fire. Now, what he found was that 11 of the first 77 men that he biopsied had prostate cancer. Now, remember, low testosterone was supposed to be protective against prostate cancer. And what he found was that approximately 14% of men with low testosterone levels had prostate cancer. Yeah. Now, Stephen, this percentage is almost the same percentage of men that have prostate cancer that have increased risk factors like an increased PSA and a positive digital rectal exam. He followed up with that study where he evaluated several hundred more men, 345 to be exact, and at that time, he found prostate cancer to be present in more than one of seven hypogonadal men with a normal PSA. An increased risk of prostate cancer was associated with more severe reductions in testosterone. In other words, the lower the testosterone levels they had, the higher rate of prostate cancer he found. So low testosterone was found not to be protective. So now we knew that. What about high testosterone levels being harmful? They must be harmful if, if lower is not protective. So in 2004, he published this paper, Risk of Testosterone Replacement Therapy and Recommendations for Monitoring. He published it in the New England Journal of Medicine. And for that paper, he did a worldwide literature review between 1985 to 2004, looking for any worrisome relationship between testosterone and prostate cancer or testosterone therapy and prostate cancer. Stephen, he was unable to find one single article that showed that testosterone increased a man's risk of getting prostate cancer or that testosterone therapy caused prostate cancer progression. Mm -hmm. He also made the astute observation that, look, there was about a tenfold increase in testosterone prescriptions around 2001 with the release of androgel. 
but yet we weren't seeing an epidemic of prostate cancer and all these men that were getting testosterone. We also know that around 50% of men aged 50 years or older have micro foci of prostate cancer in their prostates. So if increasing levels of testosterone in the men was going to cause the cancer to grow more rapidly, then we should have seen more cancer growth in those men, but we didn't. And the observation has been right in front of all of us for decades, and that is that younger men with high testosterone levels don't get prostate cancer, yeah. but instead it's a disease of aging when testosterone levels decline. So in 2007, Dr. Morgan Toller developed the saturation model to make sense of two opposite observations that the data reported. Stephen, it's a paradox. And the paradox is this, is that when we lower testosterone, the PSA levels will go down. But yet when we give testosterone to men with normal levels of testosterone, even in super physiologic doses, it has no effect on PSA. Now, this is the way that most men view prostate cancer or the prostate itself and testosterone. I even had some comments at our last at our last video with DHT and things like that, that, nope, I took testosterone and my PSA went up. Yes, sir, it, it, it did. And we're going to explain why and how that occurred. But most people view testosterone and prostate growth, cancerous or benign, via lines A and B, that the higher the testosterone levels, then the, the bigger the growth. But that's not how it really occurs. It really follows line C. And so let me explain. So we do know that castration, a zero level of testosterone, will make the PSA go down. And if you increase testosterone out of this castrate range zero, the PSA level will go up as represented by line C. But the data shows that for most of the range of testosterone, including superphysiologic ranges, there's no change in PSA level or prostate size. Stephen, prostate cancer is exquisitely sensitive to androgens in a low concentration where it is androgen dependent right here. You increase testosterone, PSA is going to go up. The prostate is very sensitive to androgen in a low androgen environment. OK, but the prostate doesn't respond to androgen concentrations above the saturation point. There it becomes androgen indifferent. Now, why is that? Now, this is because androgens have a limited ability to stimulate prostate tissue. Now, in order for the androgens to exert an effect on prostate tissue, they must first bind to the androgen receptor. And once the androgen receptors are fully saturated with androgen, then any increase will just be an excess. Mm -hmm. Now, Stephen, the saturation point in the prostate occurs at a level of around 250 nanograms per deciliter, a very low level of testosterone. Above this level, androgens have no further effect on benign or cancerous prostate tissue growth. So, yes. If a man initiates testosterone therapy with a level outside of the hypogonadal range, when his prostate is already fully saturated, then raising testosterone will have no effect on benign or cancerous prostate growth. So the man in your previous video made a comment, yes, he had a very low testosterone level. He started testosterone. We expect a rise. In fact, the guidelines, the American Neurology Association, the Enterprise Society, when a man has a low testosterone level and initiates testosterone, we can have an acceptable rise of around 1.5 over baseline. So if you have a baseline of one, his PSA is one, he has a low testosterone level, we know he has a small prostate. When he starts testosterone, it's going to cause it to increase in size up into the saturation point. And an acceptable rise after starting testosterone is about 1.5 by most guidelines. If a man starts testosterone level, starts testosterone with a level around four or 500, we expect no significant change at all in his PSA level. So this is the androgen dependent growth right here. So low testosterone, very sensitive to getting testosterone, a level of above 250, no effect. Fully, uh, the, uh, the uh, receptors are fully saturated. Yeah. All right, so, so guys can visualize this a little better. Dr. Morgenthaler likes to think of the prostate like a house plant. So he says, if you deprive the plant of water, it will shrink. If you give it water at this point, it's going to grow as represented by this picture. 
Now, giving it any additional water past this point will have no effect on growth. You could literally give it a constant water supply and it's never going to grow into a tree. Once that plant's thirst has been quenched, giving it any additional water will have no effect on growth. And the same goes for testosterone and the prostate. Mm -hmm. So that is the saturation model that explains that paradox. So what does the modern, modern uh, medical literature show us about testosterone and prostate cancer? Testosterone therapy does not increase the risk of developing prostate cancer, even in high risk individuals, Stephen. It may in fact have a protective role against high grade cancer. And studies have shown that higher levels of testosterone can suppress prostate cancer growth. In fact, there is an inverted U with regard to prostate cancer cell proliferation and testosterone levels. At low testosterone levels, there is suppression of prostate cancer cell proliferation. Between castrate levels, zero and 250, the hypogonadal range, there's actual growth. And with high levels of testosterone, there's once again, suppression of prostate cancer cell proliferation. Now this is noted in this study here done at Baylor, where two different cell lines of prostate cancers were exposed to different concentrations of testosterone. And here is your inverted U. The black line represents no testosterone. And then as we move to the right, we're getting increasing levels of uh, testosterone concentrations. And these, as you see, there's suppression, some, some degree of depression, suppression here with no testosterone. When they're exposed to a low concentration of testosterone, so the hypogonadal range, there is increase in proliferation, but with increasing levels of testosterone concentrations, there is suppression of prostate cancer cell proliferation. So this is the inverted U. Mm -hmm. This is another representation of both cell lines. A and D are zero testosterone. B and E are the two cell lines exposed to a low level of testosterone, 0.1 nanograms per milliliter. And then when the prostate cancer cells are exposed to a high level of testosterone, eight nanograms per milliliter, you see there is suppression of prostate cancer cell proliferation even more so than castrate levels. Yeah. Testosterone therapy does not increase the risk of progression in men on active surveillance. In fact, low testosterone is a predictor of who will progress on active surveillance. Testosterone therapy does not increase the risk of biochemical recurrence after treatment of prostate cancer by radiation therapy or radical prostatectomy. Studies have actually shown decreased recurrence rates in men on testosterone therapy. Multiple studies have now shown that to low testosterone, Stephen, low, is associated with an increased risk of developing prostate cancer and higher grades of cancer, a more advanced stage of cancer at surgery, and an increased recurrence after surgery. It's also associated with decreased survival. So the current landscape of testosterone therapy in the setting of prostate cancer has gone through several, par several paradigm shifts. It's evolved from viewing testosterone as dangerous and pouring gasoline on a fire to thinking it might be safe and but using it cautiously, but now as a protective measure and as therapy in castrate resistant prostate cancer. We in fact now use testosterone to treat men with castrate resistant prostate cancer. It's called bipolar androgen therapy where men are treated with high doses of testosterone followed by no testosterone. So this is where we come back to the original slide that once again is my favorite. We need to thank men like Abraham Morgan Toller for the work he's done with men on uh, testosterone. I consider him the father of uh, testosterone therapy, uh, a brilliant, brilliant man. And so this is the, the that history. This is where all the misinformation came from. And this is what the data now shows us that it's safe and that it's protective and that low testosterone levels or what we should avoid and what causes the harm and increase in morbidity and mortality. And as we discussed at the beginning of our video, we're gonna take this same approach to testosterone and estradiol management and the secondary erythrocytosis, the increase in hemoglobin and hematocrit from testosterone. Testosterone has been used for 85 years or more. It's never caused harm in any randomized control trial and the secondary erythrocytosis has never been shown to cause harm. And we, you and I will be doing a, a little podcast on this and uh, there'll, there'll 
that'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, that was an uh, incredible explanation, uh, Keith. Uh, very clear. Uh, that explains uh, really the paradox. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. I appreciate you having me on again. I look forward to seeing you again and doing more work together. Sure thing. I would ask the viewers to leave their comments uh, in the section beneath the video, and I'm sure you keep an eye on those uh, as well.